Welcome to season three of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to the public health news of the day through informative interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. With India experiencing an unprecedented and catastrophic COVID-19 outbreak, I catch up with Dr. Amita Gupta, Professor of Medicine and International Health at Johns Hopkins and Faculty Chair of the Hopkins India Institute. We talk about what's happening in India and what can be done about it. Let's listen. Dr. Gupta, thank you for taking the time to join me on the podcast. What is the situation now in India? Thank you, Josh, for that question. Um, I will say that uh, the situation in India is truly dire. It's it's really the the worst that we've seen uh, with COVID anywhere else in the world. Um, we are now um, have reached uh, five days in a row with over 350,000 cases a day, and we know that that's an underreporting. The health system is completely overwhelmed, and we have acute shortages of things like oxygen, hospital beds, um, testing, medications, um, and it, it, it's just uh, an unprecedented public health disaster. Now, some of our listeners may not be very familiar with the situation in India before this crisis has hit, and I know you've done a lot of work there. Could you set the stage a little bit? What do people need to know to even understand how critical the the situation is? Yeah, so for those, uh, so India is the second most populated country in the world with 1.4 billion people. And what that means, that's four times the size of the United States. And, um, and it's, it's got less uh, area. So people are very densely populated and it has uh, a very large number of cities with more than a million population who are living uh, very close to each other. Um, and it has a large number of migrant laborers who travel for uh, you know daily wages. Um, its health system is comprised of a public and private sector. And there really is everything from as good as care as we see here in the United States to um, care that's really sort of very under-resourced um, and even um, sort of very few sort of doctors to patient ratio. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's it, I like to say it lives in five centuries in the same time. Thank you. In that setting, we have had the pandemic for a year without you know, the kind of crisis that people feared. What, what's different now? So, you know, it's really interesting because India was, uh, when right when the world was uh, going to national or sort of uh, regional lockdowns, India took one of the most severe lockdowns um, within a short amount, within hours actually of announcing they sort of shut down the country. And that probably, while it was incredibly hard um, on, on, on sort of many, many people, it ended up sort of disrupting transmission significantly. Uh, As they reopened, they did have a a peak in September last year, um, and it was concentrated for the most part. It's very interesting, the geography of where the infections have occurred has been mostly in the north and in the west of the country. Um, and, And then they managed to sort of control that, and they were, you know, really thinking they'd overcome their first wave. Um, part of that was influenced by the fact that they thought a lot of people had gotten infected and were immune, and they really had uh, a, a low number of cases uh, in early March. What happened then in mid March? All of a sudden, things started to take off, um, and it's probably a likely combination of the following: um, some new variants circulating, which were more transmissible. A very less than ten percent of the population is vaccinated. And the economy was sort of essentially largely gone back to normal where people were, you know, in their daily bustle of life, um, having big events, um, going to marriages, going to cricket matches, going to election rallies, going to sort of big gatherings. And so it just was the perfect storm, allowing for a lot of transmission to happen very rapidly. Now, 
it, we're in a situation where everyone's worst fears are being realized. Yes. And this is exactly what we feared, right? So, you you know, when you get the most, uh, so many infections, you very rapidly overwhelm the health system. And so you run out of beds and you run out of uh, ways to take care of the six people who, um, you know, while there are a small proportion of the entire number who get infected, it's it's about that ratio of, of you know, availability of the health system to serve all the people who get sick. Uh, to the number of infections in the community. And would you say that there are multiple parts of the country in crisis or is it located in a particular area right now? No, there are definitely multiple places. It's not everywhere, um, but it's definitely in some in many major areas. So um, in Delhi, in Uttar Pradesh, which is the most populated state, in Maharashtra, which is in the western part, and in Kerala. And so there's there's six states that are representing more than uh, 55% of the infections. Um, so in that way, um, obviously, uh, some areas are being hit a lot harder than others. So what's the top priority now in this crisis moment to control the situation, even as it's getting worse? Yeah, so great question. So I think there are a couple of key things. Um, in terms of um, the health system, you know, we need immediate infrastructure for more beds, makeshift hospitals. There's an acute shortage of oxygen supplies. Uh, so there's a huge push to sort of um, for donations and just in, in country production of oxygen plants, concentrators, getting cylinders there, medical supplies. There's essential medications that we need to get to really reduce the mortality um, because uh, that, that's that's a major priority. We have to stop transmission. Second, we have to stop transmission. Um, and that's going to require imposing restrictions on movement alongside wearing high quality masks properly. Um, third, we got to test a lot more people. Unfortunately, right now, the diagnostic labs are at full capacity and people are getting turned away. There's been um, a 600% increase in testing volumes. And so we need, um, we need a lot more testing and we need rapid testing. Um, you know, they relied on the PCR test and that takes a couple of days. So people are obviously transmitting while they're um, not knowing that they're infected. We also need isolation facilities. So people who cannot isolate because they're living in very densely populated areas all in one room you know, that's very hard to isolate. So we need special facilities for that. And we clearly need a lot more coordination um, with clear top-down guidance um, and sort of visualization of where the um, most affected our areas are and how we can target resource allocation. And then, of course, um, we need to scale up more vaccinations. I mean, we have a large group of people that are still um, vulnerable to the infection. Um, so those, those are some of the immediate priorities that need to be addressed. Now, I, I have seen that the Biden administration has announced a number of steps, including making more materials available for vaccination production in India, as well as oxygen and other supplies. Do you think that um, the world is paying enough attention? Well, I think the, the world is certainly paying a lot more attention. I mean, the last uh, few days, it made headline news in all the major um, uh, newspapers. And But I think clearly more needs to be done. I mean, this is the part of the problem is we're likely not having the full extent of the the, the disease, the official numbers are underreported. Um, and so there's so much acute need that we need essentially, in, you know, deployment of military reserve supplies, multiple countries donating uh, materials very quickly. And of course, getting not only the materials, but also having workforce who can, you know, use all these supplies that are coming. So I, I feel like we really do need the Biden administration and all of the help of the United States on scale, and we need several other countries to come to the rescue, which they are starting to do. Many of European countries and others are sort of coming to the rescue. But each day, you know, we're losing lives. Very difficult to jump in when the situation is already so severe. It's like showing up at a fire that's already burning out of control. That's exactly right. That's the, the right analogy. Um, and, you know, we can't treat our way out of the disease. We must have these other, you know, mitigation measures, which we've all become so familiar in the past year. They have to be reinstated um, to break the sort of cycle of transmission. Maybe it's too early to ask this question, but what do you think the key lessons are right now for, you know, either how this could have been prevented or what we need to do better 
in in the future. I, I guess not have a sense of complacency that might have developed over the course of the year might be on that list. Absolutely. I think we uh, the country let its guard down. There was messaging that somehow, uh, you know, they had gotten past the worst of things. And so, you know, even even um, all of the infrastructure that was set for the preparing for the first wave was all dismantled largely um, because they'd never expected this. And it happened so quickly. So I think complacent, you know, you can never be complacent with this virus. Um, And we really need to strengthen our health systems and our public health systems in particular, investing in these for the long term, understanding how um, policies really do matter. Um, And um, and I think they're, you know, they let a lot of decentralization of services for this. Uh, So, you know, everybody was kind of left to figure out on their own what was needed. And as you know, from the United States, that's not necessarily the best model. Is one of the lessons that we should be thinking about a faster global distribution of vaccines. Absolutely. I think um, we we absolutely need to be providing vaccine to many different parts and not just the high-income areas, which have benefited from a lot more vaccine access. Um, Ironically, a place like India, which makes a lot of the world's uh, vaccine, was not able to sort of vaccinate its own population fast enough to be prepared for this you know, second wave. Dr. Gupta, if people are listening to this podcast and want to get involved to help India, what would you tell them? First, I'd tell them to stay informed. This is a very fast moving crisis and we need people to really know what's happening. Second, I'd say, please support the Biden administration and the other countries that are really coming to the rescue and providing a lot of aid to uh, what's a, a huge crisis. And third, as an individual, you can certainly donate to the many organizations that are providing uh, timely support. Those include the India Philanthropy Alliance, the Give India Foundation, and several others like it. Uh, many, many community-based groups will need support for many months to come. Well, Dr. Gupta, um, thank you so much for joining me. I know that you're doing a lot uh, through your work at Johns Hopkins and in India to address the situation. I I really appreciate your taking a few minutes today. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outland. Social media support from Brenda Hagader, Grace Holes Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.